Okay, uh, hi again everyone. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our fourth panel today, uh, our editor author roundtable. And uh, we're gonna be talk a bit about what it means to be published by an independent press, uh, touching on probably some of the themes that we heard in the previous panel. Uh, but we're also gonna be talking about the author editor relationship and how the two work together to bring books to readers. I think maybe it's a, a good place to start just to hear a little bit about you know, how you got to where you are and, and a little bit about um, the presses you work at and the, you know, uh, where you are in the publishing industry kind of thing. You want me to start? Would you start? Okay. Uh, well, I've been doing this a very long time and I kind of worked my way up through the ranks. I started out <clears throat> to be a lawyer and uh, realized I was gonna be a terrible lawyer and be miserable, but I had moved to New York and so I decided to start all over again and took an entry-level job at publishing and started in production worked my way into editorial, and just kept, kept at it. Uh, it's been a, an amazing trip. The great thing about the way I came in, I think, is I learned the business from, from the bottom up. I learned what the book was physically first, and then I started to learn how they were put together and understand the uh, editorial component. I knew that I wanted to work with editorial. I didn't know if I'd have any talent for it. And the fortunate thing is that it turned out I'm a really good reader. That's the main thing I think an editor is, is a really good reader. I, as an editor, I hope I represent a fairly broad section of, of the readership out there. And uh, in my, my goal in working with writers is always to shape the book in a way that's certainly true to the vision that the author had when they started, but also broaden its appeal as much as possible so that we can get as many readers to this book and to this author as we possibly can. Um, at Algonquin, when we buy a book, it's bought by the entire staff. Not that everybody has a vote on it, but we, we talk about our books to each other, to the publicists, to the marketing people, and the decisions are made uh, primarily based on how well we think we can do with the book, how well it fits in with our, our publishing program, and whether it will appeal to the fairly loyal fan base that we have. It's, there are many, there are many uh, advantages, I think, to small presses. There are some drawbacks. We don't have deep pockets, so we can't afford to pay big advances to writers. Um, and we end up not publishing a lot of books that we would love to publish because other people are willing to pay a lot more. But we have, over time, found a, a, a loyal group of writers to work with us. Uh, Amy's one of our most recent uh, additions, and I hope she will be with us for a while. Um, I'm Amy Rowland, and uh, I work at the Times Book Review. Um, I had a very long road to both publication and the Times Book Review. As a matter of fact, I might be one of the last people who can say I found my first job at the New York Times Classified Advertising. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I actually started at the New York Times in Classified Advertising, and it was a very long road to the book review, but um, I went uh, through the ranks or maybe sideways and uh, eventually found my happy place um, where I currently am doing a tremendous amount of line editing, it seems like, these days. Um, I wanted to write a book, a novel, for a long time. I wrote a bad novel, and uh, I took me a while to try again. Um, but I worked along, I would like to say steadily, but um, I worked along, and uh, eventually I found a home with Algonquin. So. Um, it's just so marvelous to be here and be in this space, and I've um, just want to say thanks to Kevin and to Elliot for all the things that Poets and Writers does for this community and a community around the country. It's just an honor to be here in the Library of Congress. I would, um, I would invite our Congress people to use their library. Um, but I, I hope you walk away from um, um, all of these panels. Um, it's just so marvelous to um, um, hear the other editors and publishers talk um, a, about seeing how many different possibilities and options there are for, for you as writers. Um, and for me as a reader, I, I um, um, love that. And, and Grey Wolf aspires to being um, um, frequently an alternative to... Um, 
uh, to what you might see on the New York Times bestseller list, though we like it when, when we have a book or two um, on that list from, um, from, from time to time, too. I love what Chuck said in terms of um, one of the things that makes independent publishing so vibrant is that the whole house gets behind any decision that any individual makes across the board, and whether that's a decision in terms of our funding platforms, um, in terms of what our website looks like, in terms of what Jeffrey's cover <laughs> looks like, um, in terms of who we're publishing and how we're publishing them. Um, and I, I think that's something to think about as a writer um, um, that um, can't be overemphasized in terms of something that's in your pocket as a creative person. Um, I, I think like uh, both Chuck and Jeff were saying, we, uh, we work as a, a kind of collective as far as decisions and as far as getting behind um, decisions and things. And we've always, I mean, New Directions, it started uh, in 1936. James Lachlan started the press, um, started publishing a lot of um, modernist uh, works of literature here and from abroad. Um, so we built up quite a backlist over the years and we've kind of tried to keep with that vision of the press. And we've stayed um, the same size for, uh, it's roughly around 30 books per year um, that we publish there. So I do a lot of editorial uh, work. And, um, and then a couple, two, a couple years ago, I started working at New York Review of Books, or not the magazine, the book side. Um, the opportunity came up, I was able to kind of negotiate um, both work situations and we've been doing a lot of, um, or I've been doing a lot of uh, other stuff besides f the fiction and poetry that I have been working uh, with at New Directions, so some nonfiction uh, and some a couple children's books, which is a lot of fun as well. Um, and then as far as uh, Grey Wolf, no, I, I guess we'll talk more about um, that whole thing, but I couldn't be more fortunate with Jeff and how attentive he is as an editor to the work and just to talking through things and just the press in general. So, but we could say more about that. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I, I would really like to hear from uh, a little bit more from Amy and from uh, Jeffrey about exactly how you um, wound up at, <laughs> uh, with these fine gentlemen here. Um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the um, articles in the current issue that you all have is, um, you know, this feature on 11 small press authors and their publishing partners, and, and Amy and Chuck are both featured in there. And what we tried to do was sort of just get at the, you know, sort of the story, uh, the backstory a little bit about how these two people meet uh, to, to create something as, as beautiful as a book. Um, so y you mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, how you wrote the book, but uh, if you could just talk a li little bit about both of you, um, about, you know, the, the steps along the way. How, how did you, it, you didn't just wake up and have Chuck at your door um, saying, I want to push, publish your book, so. <laughs> no, um, I'm incredibly fortunate, and, and looking back, uh, it's amazing how it all came together. Um, you know, in retrospect, it seems like it, things seem so much clearer, but to be honest, um, when I finished the book, I wasn't even sure it was finished, and I sent it to my agent, and he said, well, you know, yeah, it's, it's done. Let's send it out small, you know, to a smaller group. And he sent it out to five or six places, and I spoke to three editors, um, and Chuck was just by far the most insightful reader. I, as soon as I spoke with Chuck about the book, um, I... Uh, I felt that I um, that the book had found its its editor, um, and so fortunately, Algonquin agreed with Chuck, the team, and uh, and and they acquired it shortly shortly after. Okay. I, if you've not read the Transcriptionist, uh, you should. But Amy's got a wonderful voice, and um, uh, it was immediately apparent when you started reading that you were you were reading a, a real writer and somebody who knew what she was doing. And so everyone agreed that this was a writer and a book we should take on. I, to, I don't think it will surprise Amy if I say we knew going in that this was not gonna be like a blockbuster book in terms of sell, selling millions of copies out of the gate. But we felt that the talent was is so pronounced there that we could build this writer using this book as a basis and, and, and help her grow. 
How often do you actually have that feeling this is going to be a blockbuster right out of the gate? Because you've had some. I've had a and, couple. And, and, and I will say that of the two that I've had at, at uh, Algonquin, uh, Water for Elephants and Reliable Wife, uh, I thought Reliable Wife would be a huge book. I had no idea that Water for Elephants would be a huge book. Um, and I have bought, I bought a book recently um, uh, that I think can be a huge, huge book, but we'll see. I'd known, I known I didn't know Jeff at the time, but I knew who he was at the press, and I just kind of took a chance. I I, I sent it to him with a letter. I can't even remember what I said in the letter. But so, so as a poet, you I were remember. able to just <laughs> yeah. write directly to to uh, to Jeff. Yeah, I don't send him your. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you even have like was that wrong? <laughs> I can't even remember if that was. A time. It worked out. <laughs> if it was an open submission, no. But so so I when I sent it to him and. Um, um, he really responded well to it. And at the time, I mean, the book was originally structured around 45 poems, and, uh, and that was the kind of number I was uh, dealing with. But um, it was really through talking to him more about it that, that it kind of, it actually grew a little bit. Because I had, a, the way the book is structured, there's, there's, there, there was room for that. Uh, it's, uh, and, and so it expanded into 55 poems, which really became central to the book. And so, I, I mean, I, that was, for me, that was another really unexpected thing because I had other ideas that, that um, I had originally um, for the book that I kind of had scrapped um, and then had, had just sent him this thing. But, but going back to it, it really shaped, it helped shape um, the final book. I remember it very well because um, because I was blown away by this work and it was um, you know as Jeffrey's mo very modestly typically very <laughs> modestly sort of saying I mean it was a very um, single page cover letter with sort of an unassuming author bio I mean there's this was not a um, this didn't come from an agent you know this commercial question for poetry especially a first book of poetry that goes away which is the most marvelous thing in terms of, as an editor, you get to just read this and um, confront it on its own terms. Um, there's no agent mediating that conversation, um, uh, in, at least in this case. Some, some poets certainly have agents and we can talk, talk about that, but, um, but it was a very unassuming, um, um, you know, you know as, as Jeffrey was saying, yeah, 45 pump, even, I remember one of the things, yeah, this, this is kind of brief, you know, we, we need to kind of move, move this, this forward, but I was just, what this book is, it became this, an aquarium, I don't know if you can see this, Jeffrey was talking about the importance of numbers in it, and so we have five um, pieces just to indicate that to, um, to the reader um, throughout, but it's a, um, Abecedarian, which is to say it's, it's alphabetical from um, abalone to zooxanthellae. And how many poetry manuscripts can you think of that are sent to you by someone who says, um, what I primarily studied was marine biology? <laughs> That's kind of remarkable. You know, or I, that, that was something that did make me sort of stand up and say, you know, this, this is unusual. And um, so that's one part of this collection was its interesting form across these, um, across the alphabet. And then um, all the marine, um, by all, all the poems are named for, you know, kelp and zooxanthellae and all of these, um, um, you know, the crab and all of these things. And, and um, so there's that layer that was going on. Then there's this, this sort of remarkable intersection of sort of philosophy translation, and then the part that really um, uh, um, moved me emotionally, which I think has to be there for poetry to some um, degree, maybe any genre, is that there are moments in Jeffrey's, in these poems, where they often end with this sort of aphoristic turn. Be like the crab and move slantwise, you know, and philosophers, poets, um, and our Congress people, I don't think you quite say that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but it moves with these sort of aphoristic moments, and what, what you find out across the book is that there are also poems from a father to a son, and a way of imparting knowledge um, across a generation. The fact that all of these things were happening in one poem, let alone across this whole book, 
was, made me stand up and say, this is really unusual work. Wow. Even for first books of poetry at, at a press like Grey Wolf, you know, we, we sit down and have a, a meeting. And we talk about you know, what this book is, you know, why I'm excited about it as the editor, why you know, I shared several of the poems around the staff. You know, is, is this the book that we can sell? And we got really excited about this aquarium marine biology because that, that allowed our marketing team, our promotional team, to think about this. Yes, we can reach the poetry audience. And yes, we can use the fact that Jeffrey Yang is an editor at New Director. All those, he's established in the genre in a certain way. But how many poetry books are... Um, um, about marine biology. So it, it gave us this whole other way to think about the book. Maybe so, um, uh, Chuck, uh, Jeff, and, and Jeffrey, you could uh, say a word about New Directions, but um, you know, it, do you work, ex now Jeff, I know the answer is you don't work exclusively with agents, but um, Chuck, maybe you could say a little bit about, you know, is someone able to just send a manuscript to Algonquin or are you working specifically with agents? Well, I work primarily with agents, but we are open to uh, unsolicited manuscripts or unsolicited um, queries. I mean, I have bought one book uh, that came in without an agent. Um, primarily, I deal with agents, though, because agents know um, the kinds of books that Algonquin is comfortable publishing and they know the kinds of books that I work best with, as opposed to the editor, the other editors there. So, I will say that I prefer if when I buy a book that doesn't have an agent, uh, I try to help the author get an agent because I think the author needs an agent to protect them from the publisher, and I also think that uh, I have had the experience of sometimes where an author and I might not see eye to eye on something, and the agent is usually the intermediary to, that I go to and say, can you help me with this? Or do you agree with me on this? And if you do, will you help me with this? C could you talk for just a second about what an unsolicited query actually involves uh, for, for those who may not know exactly what that means? Well, if it were a work of fiction, um, I, would I would say you should send a, a letter that uh, briefly states what you've written and what you, what you, uh, who you see the audience as being. Um, admittedly, it's very hard to tell anything about what, what a novel's gonna be like just from a query letter, but uh, you'd be amazed how badly written a lot of query letters are. <laughs> um, and so we can, we can eliminate a lot of things that way. Um, there are so many, many people out there who, who um, you know, have something they wanna write, and, and I, I want them to write it, but not everything needs to be read by everybody. So. Um, Kevin, I'm interested in, in the fact that I would say, um, since I started in 1996, um, I have seen the number of agented submissions for poetry increase significantly. Um, and I, I don't know if that signals a desperation on the, on the part of, of agents or if more positively signals that more agents are open to um, the kinds of works that poets are writing, either in lines, either in poetry, or that there's sort of more and more a culture around poets writing uh, novels and writing uh, memoirs or essays or these sorts of things too. I mean, a, a good editor is not sitting at their desk waiting for submissions, whether they're from an agent or from an author. I mean, the way that we're tending to, I suspect this is true for, um, for all of us here, is the way that we're tending to find authors is going out and meeting people and keeping our ear to the, you know, to the ground, talking to, I love getting to um, talk to Jeffrey, like, who are you reading? What are you thinking about? What magazines are you reading? What online sites are you reading? Who are you following on Twitter? Not that Jeffrey does that. But, but, but you know, what, what conversations are, um, are percolating up and that people are thinking about and talking about in terms of subject matter, styles, particular authors, all of those sorts of things. So I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of what the author-editor relationship is really like and what you guys actually do together and how you guys interact throughout the process. Well, I, before we decided to publish any book, uh, the editor has a conversation with the author um, and talks about, we did this, didn't we? I think we did. We had a conversation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, we talked... I talk about, uh, to the author about the things that I love about the book and the things that I think maybe aren't as strong as, uh, as they could be. And um, try to get a sense of whether the author is, 
you know, agrees and will, is willing to work with me on those points. And, and in the case with Amy, you were, you were very receptive to, to my thoughts and you even had, as I think you've later said, you said that I hit on some points that you had been, you'd been thinking about already. So we had a very smooth working relationship um, because uh, I, do, I then do a line edit, which um, I'm very slow at, but uh, I read the book very, very carefully. And I, 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 um, uh, when I come to anything that makes me stop, as a reader, when I've come to anything that's a word or what something a character does that I feel is out of character, or whatever, that I sit and try to figure out what was wrong there. And I may just cross the word out and change it. I may put a, a, a question on the, on the margin and say, wouldn't it be better if such and such? But I go through the whole book very slowly, very carefully that way, and send it off to the, to the author, and then it comes back much better, usually. So every now and then I have a situation where um, I don't, the author and I don't see eye to eye, and, uh, and it can become um, um, contentious sometimes because I know I'm right. <laughs> it's, as, it's as simple as that. And, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's really nothing quite like, or nothing as gratifying and as mortifying as uh, as an editor being edited by a better editor. <laughs> so, um, when I got my manuscript back from Chuck, I, uh, you know, it's it's shocking the things that you do as a writer when you're an editor because it's very difficult to be both at the same time, um, and. That's something I've, I've struggled with a lot, but you have to, to a certain extent, I think, or I do, you have to turn off the editorial eye uh, while you're writing. Um, and then when Chuck sent the manuscript back to me, um, <laughs> after I recovered, um, no, it, it was actually a, a very, it was a, very, very light, it edit. Was a light edit. Um, <laughs> And uh, I really appreciated his, his comments and his insights. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty smooth process. Also, the great thing about working for a newspaper is um, you're just so deadline driven. I mean, I would say to Chuck, what's the deadline? You know, mm -hmm. And then I would send the manuscript back. And then we had a couple of back and forths, but not too many. And then um, it went to a copy editor. Algonquin still uses copy editors, and the copy editor was excellent. Also, a mortifying experience, <laughs> um, but it was uh, it was pretty smooth. Yeah. Um, and that's the the one of the strangest things about publishing, I think, is you know you work for years on a book, and then you know somebody tries to sell it, and then um, once it's sold, you're ready for it to come out, and you know, your family's saying, when can I buy your book? And you're saying, you know, oh, year or two. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and then you're waiting for the edit, and then, you know, it, so it's a lot of hurry up and wait um, in the process that I've found. Well, let me just interject here, this could be one of the problems with the small press, especially Algonquin. We only do 20 books a year, 10, 10 fiction, 10 nonfiction. We might, uh, do 12, we might do nine, but it's normally uh, just 10 of each. And when we find a book we love, we buy it. And then we go like, hmm, now when can we publish this? Um, with, with Jeffrey and the kind of editorial back and forth that happened, I mean, as you heard Jeffrey say earlier, I, I'd say with that first book, um, An Aquarium, there was a large part of it that was challenging him to write more, <laughs> was, that, was, was just actually adding um, to, to the book. One of the main things I do with a poetry book um, as an editor is really um, working with authors in terms of the organization of the book. With Jeffrey's book, that organization was a set form. So that meant um, that that was sort of in place, um, which was something I think um, we got to lean on in terms of, is this a book that is sort of meant to be flipped through and then, oh, I, here's a poem, um, you know, K Hog, I'm going to read that, you know, or is it meant to be read first poem first, second poem second, third, and so on? And um, that was part of the conversation that we had. And um, um, Jeffrey was very certain that the book, um, even within that alphabetical form, also needed to follow a reader through. Um, a set of these aphorisms that I was talking about, a set of these kind of um, qu 
questions and issues as they're presented across the book. So you really are meant to read it, um, obviously not the way that we read a novel or something, but, um, um, but piece by piece. And what does it mean for this aquarium, in fact, to kind of grow <laughs> as you're going through it? I mean, you're, you're literally walking through the theaters of, those glowing theaters of aqu aquariums. Um, um, walking through this book or going through this book. And it um, kind of breathtakingly culminates in this poem, Zuzanthali, which is by far the longest poem um, in it. And it culminates into, into this kind of um, deep environmental argument for what our country is doing, polluting the waters of the Pacific. And it's, it's, an, ex and it's an extraordinary um, move um, um, in that book. So a lot of the thinking was, you know, how do we, how do we get the reader there? How, how do these poems accrue such that poem both surprises but also feels like the inevitable end to this book? And I, to me, that's the just kind of breathtaking thing about it. Or, or As I said before, I mean, it, it was nice to have um, Jeff's feedback originally because I had discarded some, some things, ideas that I had before just to try and, and get it down, to condense it down to 45. So I'll, I'll, as far as like editorial stuff, I can't, even, I can't remember, I don't think he, there was a line you didn't like and took out. <laughs> I mean, as, as an editor uh, myself, I, I find with poetry, especially um, poetry written in English, I, I, it is a lot more, if there is any kind of uh, um, a direct kind of editorial kind of things, it's through the, the, the poets, kind of one, usually asking for it, or, or a, a very specific issue or something, or two, kind of uh, like or overall organizational things, which tend to be a bit more flexible with poetry. You know, as, as the publication date nears, you know, um, I mean, these days it's, it's uh, all about uh, promoting, the, you know, uh, self-promotion and social media and all of this. And I'm just wondering sort of how much you um, what, what about with the author? Um, at what point does that enter the conversation? And also, what exactly is involved there? I mean, uh, in terms of talking about the platform and, and what the special kinds of things the author may or may not be able to do to sort of give an extra push to the book. Well, at, uh, for us, with fiction, um, we don't so much look for platforms. Uh, I was here for part of the earlier panel, and I think they talked about the fact that it's, it's what's on the page that's most important. And when it, when it comes to fiction, I think that's true for us primarily. We, we, we look at the book, and if the book is strong and we feel like it's a book that we can publish well and be proud of it, uh, then we don't so much worry that the author may not be um, uh, able or willing to do a lot of self-promotion. We do a fair amount of publicity with the authors when possible. Uh, it's with the nonfiction that we really look for the platforms because uh, that's, it's imperative if you're, if you're writing in a, in a field that, to, uh, uh, if you're writing about music that you've got connections in the, in the music field and you can get out there and, 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 and get your name out there. Um, and Amy can speak to the experience she had with us. Uh, I don't, I think you did a kind of limited tour. I did. Um, I did because, only because I couldn't get more time off work. I felt that the publicity team at Algonquin, I mean, they were great. And I said at one point um, to some friends, I said, you know, I feel like if I could take six months off work, I could get out there and sell this book and they'd be <laughs> right behind me. Um, but having a day job, I, I did a, I think a seven to 10 day book tour. Um, I went to some cities where I knew some people. Um, it was small, it was, it was fun. Um, it was, to be honest, it, it really exceeded my expectations because I feel, you know, working at a book review, I'm pretty realistic, uh, perhaps skeptical about the business, um, you know, and, and you realize um, how, how limited the resources and dedicated the people are at independent presses. Um, and so I wasn't really expecting to do much at all. Um, but Algonquin's publicity team is, is great, and they, they sent me everywhere that, you know, I could go. And um, it was, yeah, it was, it was a nice experience. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a nonprofit publisher, we don't, um, you know, have massive coffers in terms of, um, 
you know, promotion for big tours and splashy ads in the New Yorker and, um, you know, all of this sort of thing. So you do have to be very smart and very nimble. Um, and, and that's very true for poetry as well as nonfiction and, and, um, and fiction. In terms of um, an aquarium, just to keep using it as an example, um, it was that marine biology part that our marketing team really um, grasped onto. I mean, we have a very, um, Grey Wolf is known for poetry, so we have a lot of um, strong, um, I, I hope strong tentacles out there with um, the poetry communities across the country in terms of, um, here's, here's an, <laughs> tentacles and an aquarium. Uh, <laughs> I need a drink. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, that allows us to kind of reach, yeah, the New York Times and the New Yorker and Poets and Writers and Poetry Magazine and so on and so on and so on um, with um, our catalog of, of titles. I, I hope in a pretty um, solid and ongoing kinds of ways. So a lot of our question in terms of promotion becomes, um, yes, this is a book of poetry, but what, el what else is it? <laughs> what, what else does it do? Um, readers aren't just sitting around necessarily waiting for a book of poems to sort of plunk into their laps, or those that are, we're good at reaching anyway. What, what else is this thing? So we really did reach out to the National Aquariums and all sorts of, you know, marine biology programs, and we even had Jeffrey in, ended up doing some marvelous events at, at aquariums. Uh, I mean, personally, as just like personal temperament, I mean, I really had to get over... Uh, um, being in front of people, because I, I wasn't particularly uh, good at it or wanting to be in front of people. But I think uh, as a poet, what I uh, started to do more uh, later on was readings uh, of, of, and I've always loved going to readings uh, since in, in college. And so, and I feel like with, read, with a poetry reading, it, while you're reading, you're, able, you're really able to immerse yourself in the work and kind of forget about um, being in front of people. I mean, my, one of, my favorite poets is Emily Dickinson, and so what can you really say like about <laughs> that? <laughs> I mean, as about as you know, expectations of of things. But um, as far as this book, uh, an aquarium specifically, uh, no, that we we. I remember we, I was at the Long Beach Aquarium. They have a they really try and get um, the local community involved in every kind of aspect uh, from from arts perspective to um, elementary schools. This is getting kind of obscure, but uh, so they wanted me to go and um, and ha teach kind of this workshop with people who actually signed up for it through the aquarium. Like, to, to, um, and we, you know, we just went through and, and we did, did some writing um, um, things together and in the aquarium, and it was actually really fun. And then I gave a reading in front of this, in front of this big tank, uh, where where the where the kelp fish were actually breeding. <laughs> and I saw my grandmother actually came. came this has nothing to do with anything, but my grandmother was actually came, and I could see her in the front. And she just was asleep the whole time. <laughs> but, um, is there just is there some sort of advice that you could give uh, from each of your perspectives as an editor or an author? Um, advice to writers as they, you know, either begin or continue their uh, their their journey toward uh, getting a publisher. The best thing I can I can tell a writer, I guess, is to to have in mind who you're writing for. Um, try to envision your reader, and try to make sure that you um, uh, are constantly entertaining them. That you're not um, uh, going to violate the kind of, of uh, bond that you created with the opening of your book and uh, um, and read, 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 read to see what other people have done and succeeded with. Um, I'm reluctant to give advice, especially considering how long it took me to find this room today. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I would say, um, for me anyway, um, the important thing was to well, patience, a, a balance between patience and, and motivation. Um, it took me a long time to finish my first novel, and, um, and that's not something I expected when I was 25. Um, you want to be both uh, realistic and, and positive and, um, you know, figure out what you're comfortable with <clears throat> and 
you know, what the best path for you is and how, how to pursue it. Um, and sometimes, you know, that takes a little, um, it takes a little time to figure out. And, um, and sometimes you, you know, you have to be flexible. Um, so, yeah, that's really not very good advice. But I think, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it anyway, and nobody can stop you, and that's what you should do. Yeah, I, I would um, I would echo Chuck and just read, read, read as much as you can and as widely as you can and, and read really actively. Uh, one of the marvelous things um, a teacher of mine said, a writing teacher one, one time was, write down, even in a little journal, um, the title of the book that you're reading and then the publisher um, and the author also, also too there. And, and what you will start finding is that, you know, for those of you wondering, well, how do I know where to send my work? What do I, what do, I do? This exercise is really powerful a after you've done this for a year, two years, three years. My guess is you're going to find that publisher, oddly enough, in the natural rhythms of what you're reading. Yeah. Um, the other thing I, I guess I would say, and I think Jeffrey's a marvelous example um, of, of this, and I... Um, aspire um, to, to be like him, is don't be just one thing. Um, one of the things that's so great, I mean, he's um, a, a writer, but he's also a marine biologist, and he's also an editor, and he also translates from the Chinese. I mean, the more selves that you have, none of us are singular beings. How boring would that be? Um, so the more kind of multiple you can be, um, in your writing and the way that you present yourself as a creative person, um, that's really powerful. Um, well, I failed in marine biology, so... <laughs> <laughs> I guess... I take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> I guess fail if you want to write, fail in everything else, and then you have to write. <laughs> no, I, mean, no um, I guess uh, it's... Uh, Writing, I mean, very basically, writing something that you w love to read yourself. I mean, that's, I think, I think the advice that is people have given a lot. Um, and also that, that leads into this idea of reading deeply and into, and seeing various traditions, because it just goes so far back and it's so rich and just, engage, I think, engaging deeply with those kinds of things and really digging deep. Because I think a lot of, I mean, we're talking about independent presses here and the larger uh, population of um, our country isn't really aware uh, of, of that. And, it, and I think the more you dig, the more you kind of look uh, into what you really love and what you love to read and see, then I think that it'll just help in, in general, yeah. Excuse me, about how many agents would you say you work with in a year, or do you have uh, sort of your six go-to agents, and this question is both for you, Chuck, and for you, Jack. Well, I get submissions from probably um, 30, 40 agents, I guess, on a regular basis. There are a handful that I have worked with multiple times, and um, I, to be, I mean, if there are certain agents that when they send me something, I'm going to look at it right away. And there are other agents that I have not worked with that I will I'll look at it, but I, it's not going to be at the top of my pile. Um, so it's the ones that, that I, that who know me best and who know my taste best are the ones that I, I kind of rely on, but I have to do my research and what Jeff was saying earlier. That, that, that editors are supposed to be doing that it sounds like he does and I don't is, is read journals and read magazines and, and contact people on a constant basis because it's, that's the way you bring in uh, new talent, new ideas. Um, I probably receive submissions from, I'd say 20 to 25 agents um, um, a year, but uh, like Chuck, there are those three or four who really get Gray Wolf, <laughs> which is very particular, you know, in terms of sort of literary, we're more literary than we are commercial, you know, that, that understands sort of what we're looking for, let alone those agents, as I was mentioning before, that take a risk with something like translation or poetry or those sorts of things. I have, I think, an oddball question. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All of you read for a living. You read lots, prodigiously. I sat 
back here thinking, my God, do these people do anything else in their lives? And I thought, but they're always reading with the idea of judging, is this suitable for, for publication? Would I want to buy this? And I thought, can you ever turn that off and just read for sheer pleasure? Um, I don't, my, my idea of relaxing in the evening is watching reality TV. <laughs> um, it's about as mindless as anything can be. When I go on, when I go on holiday, I, I, like I read uh, Goldfinch. I had a, a week and I sat on the beach and read Goldfinch and I loved it. And I, yes, I can read for pleasure, but, uh, but I will say that the book is too long and needed editing. So. <laughs> <laughs> <I agree. laughs> I, I think that's a great question, um, and one of the, the great laments that I hear every editor say is, I wish I got to read more for pleasure or read more printed books from other publishers. I really try to make a huge point to try to do that because it is part of what makes me a better reader to do my, to do my job better. Whether or not I shut off the um, you know, editor's eye is maybe another, uh, another question. Since I, I really don't um, edit um, fiction, that, to me, across the board is a marvelous, um, I wouldn't necessarily say escape, but a, but a marvelous thing that I get to add to um, hopefully my eye in, in terms of what makes great prose sentences.